And good evening, LBE community and, and family and uh, viewers. If you haven't become a, a frequent or regular visitor, uh, welcome. And uh, as I always like to say, uh, each broadcast is always a special broadcast. And I always say this one is especially special and nothing different this evening. Uh, it's wonderful to have uh, some beautiful brothers in the studio this evening to talk about uh, mothers, moms, mommy. And uh, we know that Mother's Day is on Sunday. And so we wanted to uh, bring the barbershop, the LBE barbershop on, and, and it's very special special that we as viewers get to eavesdrop on conversations that black men typically have in the barbershop. And, and I would imagine mothers um, is a topic that probably comes up somewhat, somewhat often. Uh, so Brother Jermaine, our resident uh, facilitator of the barbershop and, and other topics. I, I like to refer to him as our resident mental health guru. How are you this evening, brother? Oh, I'm great. I've been looking forward to this so, all day. <laughs> good. Me too, me too. So I know I, I, I have this special privilege, but I'm going to leave the barbershop now and, and listen from the other side and I'll be back on the end. Have a good conversation. Thank you so much, Thank Sister you. Lewis. Uh, to everyone watching, you know, like Reverend Lewis just said, we're here to really talk about one thing, one thing only. If you've attended our last couple of sessions, uh, you know, sometimes the topics we cover can be kind of heavy. So I've been looking forward to the opportunity of today's session to maybe take a different direction. And we're going to talk about our moms. Uh, Mother's Day is on Sunday. Uh, you can tell just by looking at me, I'm a mama's boy. Um, and so I get <laughs> excited any chance I get to talk about our moms. Um, but before we get started, we'll just take a quick minute to introduce ourselves. I'll go first and then we'll go around. Um, Jermaine Barkley, I work at Health Choice Arizona uh, as their first episode psychosis uh, grant coordinator. And I'm also the chair of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Council for Blue Cross and assistant vice chair for Arizona uh, for the Coconino African Diaspora Advisory Council. A lot of acronyms. We'll go over to you, Kevin Chase. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Kevin Chase. Um, I am recently just actually resigned from my position at Northern Arizona University about two weeks ago, but I was a director of the Upward Bound Math Science Program, which is a program that serves first generation low income and disabled students in high school. So I'm glad to be here tonight. Hey, glad to have you. Then we got Reverend Richard. How are you? I'm glad to be here this evening. I am the pastor of Prince Chapel AME Church in Tucson, Arizona. I'm also a criminal defense attorney. I work with um, the city of Phoenix and um, I'm ecstatic to be here tonight. Beautiful, we're ecstatic to have you. And then we've got Edward Lumpkin. Hi, uh, good evening, Edward Lumpkin. Um, actually, I'm a manager for American Express. So I've been in the bank industry for a while. Also, I am the uh, first vice president for uh, the Phoenix chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Beautiful, beautiful. Great to have y'all. And again, thanks for joining. Um, so first and foremost, we'll jump right in. And I'm just going to kind of throw out uh, an open question for anyone to take uh, as they want. Um, when you talk about the Black family and the Black experience, can you tell me from your perspective as a Black man, what does motherhood mean to you? Well, I'll jump into it. I, I saw Kevin was about to say something. I, I'll jump into it. And, and I guess for me, um, motherhood is, is a, a particular position that's um, extremely respected, especially in my family. Um, I had an opportunity to live with my great grandmother, my grandmother, um, as well as my, my mom who's still alive. And she and I, we talk every morning and laugh about everything. Um, but you find, you know, from the very beginning that um, there's a great deal of love. You understand 
um, what they do as far as making sure that you have what you need. Um, they stand up for you when it, your father's ready to give you that spanking and it's like, you know, no, you know, let, let me save my son. Um, they're encouraging you. They're making sure that homework is done. Um, they are always concerned about you when you walk out of that door, door especially as you get older. Um, and, and once you become a man, it, that doesn't stop at all. Um, as a criminal defense attorney, I can tell you right now, 98% of the time, I have the mothers in the courtroom, uh, mm -hmm. don't have the fathers, mm -hmm. you know, and um, they're the first ones to get on the phone and call and say to help my son, you know, um, and they love they love their daughters as well, you know, trying to make sure that they raise them in such a way to be the women they need to be. So motherhood, um, especially my family, is, is still very near and dear to our hearts. And um, I'm sure throughout the United States, throughout the world is probably the same as well. I'm gonna go ahead and piggyback off, the, off Mr. Richard um, and use a couple adjectives to describe motherhood to me. Um, you know, caring, I think resourceful, um, tough love, um, uh, always have your back. Um, you know, my mom, you know, just going into it, you know, has, has you know, raised three kids. You know, um, my dad passed away when I was 13, my brother 12, my sister five. And so showing great strength and you know, developing three incredible individuals, um, and I think I don't know if I'm a mama's boy though. I don't, I don't know about that one. You know, I look like my mother um, definitely, and I do take uh, some of her characteristics in in terms of the sort of caring part and you know, leading by example, right? And so, um, so that's how I would des describe motherhood. You know what, you brothers have uh, some very good. Uh explanations and you know i think it's kind of fits fits right in i mean why wouldn't it um i mean it's very descriptive i i, I wrote down uh, something that i i think that kind of sums it up at least for me backbone mm. you know my mom was the the backbone of uh of the family household um mm. she was extremely vital especially when you know my parents divorced and you know i it was my mom that primarily was yeah. the uh the uh the, the caregiver and um, you know she was phenomenal raised two great kids who in turn you know supported and loved her grandchildren provided an excellent role role model just like you know her mom did for her so I would say you know the backbone of the of the of the household yeah and resilient man moms are you know, that's the common theme that I'm kind of hearing, man. They make it work. You know, moms make it work a lot of times, regardless of what your situation is. Mm -hmm. They're making sure, you know, when you're a kid, when, you, when you're like a parent and you've got a kid, you don't want your kids to know necessarily when things are hard, if you guys are struggling. You want them to be comfortable and happy, right? And, you know, I know my mom in particular, she was crucial in making sure you know, even when we weren't doing the best, you know, we got food on the table and it tastes good. You know, <laughs> you know, they're saving up for Christmas, even if it was a real hard year to make sure we feel comfortable, make sure we got the things that we need for school. Um, you know, regardless of the resources that you give them, they're kind of magicians, right? They, they can pull it out the hat, regardless of what you gave them in the first place. Um, and, and they really make things work. My mom, uh, you know, my mom is a is an immigrant. They came over on my mom's side from Mexico when she was just a little kid, um, and they crossed the border. And she joined the army when she was eighteen, I think, right out of high school. And met my dad right at eighteen. Um, got pregnant, had me at twenty. You know, my dad stayed in the army, so my dad was gone a whole lot. You know, because he was a soldier, and 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 so he was either deployed or out in the field or out in training. And and you know, it was really my mom that was the anchor of. You know, while dad's away, even if we live hundreds and hundreds of miles away from family, you're still going to feel like you've got a home here, right? You know, even if you're not around any other family, we don't have much, you're going to feel like you've got a home because mom is there. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's what I, I think of every time I think of what motherhood is. It, it's just like that home base. You know, you always got mama to go back to. It's, it's just that moving home for you. Um, so I guess my next question is specifically about your moms. If you had to describe your mom to somebody, 
who is she? Yeah, who, who's your mom? And, and remember that this is recorded, so there's a good chance that they'll, <laughs> that they'll probably see it. That's a good one. My mm. mom was, um, is, because she's still alive, grace under pressure. You know, it, the proverbial bullets could be flying and you couldn't, and you, you wouldn't know. Mm. You know, she made chaos look like you know, just it, it was routine. She made the impossible possible. You know, so I, I, I can just describe my mom as being very, um, she's very strong, um, strong will, but not strong will to where she won't listen to, to reason. Uh, she is one that has provided excellent guidance and continues to do so. She's one that has uh, a compassionate heart and in turn has encouraged me to also have that same compassion and somebody to emulate. And she's an excellent role model. She's just, she's my world. So that's how I would describe my mom. Man, um, how would I Good describe luck, brother. Um, Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> Like I said earlier, leading by example, my mom is a woman of few words, right? And, and um, but when she speaks, you tune in, right? And so, uh, you know, some of the prime examples I have is when, like I said, my father had passed away at a young age for me and my brother and my sister. And I just saw my mom sort of keep that steady road, right? Times were hard, times were horrible but she kept that steady path. And, you know, I noticed that, wow, she is still moving one step ahead of the other, right? You know, and making sure we had food on the table, making sure, you know, everything was straight. And so recently, you know, I, I've, I've watched her um, and they're in Maryland. I watched her, you know, uh, feed people, uh, clothe people who didn't have clothes, you know, um, you know, take baby clothes to folks and different things like that. And I'm like, wow, you know, I think that's where I get sort of my carry my work from is to make sure that people are taken care of. So a woman of not a lot of words, but when she talked, you paid attention. Um, she loved to have fun. You know, she's a practical joker, right? Loves to eat. I'll put that out there too. So this is recorded. That's okay. She loves to eat. Um, and just a person that I'm proud to have as a mom. Right. You know, you, you talk about, well, describe your mom. Well, I'm just proud. You know, she's she's raised, like I said, three incredible kids, um, has done her best, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I that's my mom in a nutshell. Yeah. And that's a that's a great way to to, to describe it. You, you said loves to eat, but you didn't say anything past that. So I think you're in the clear, you know, <laughs> I, you know, yeah. You know, my mom, because, you know, because she's only 20 years older than me, almost exactly, right? You yeah, know, yeah, they, yeah. my parents are always joking, you know, when I get old, when, when they get old, they always say, I'm going to be old, you know, right. even though, yeah, I'll be, you know, and so they're not that much older than me. And, and my mom, I think that kind of influenced how she raised, especially me being the firstborn son, yeah. you know, she just, she talked to me a lot. She talked to me a lot. And the older I got, you know, through my teenage years and college and adulthood, you know, we are always able to have these, like, these adult conversations, you know, where she's more than willing to admit she's not perfect. But like you said, she always tried her best. That always showed. And, I, and there's something about having those conversations when you've got that relationship with your mom, especially as an adult, you know, as an adult man trying to figure out how to run his family, how to be a good adult, how to be a good role model. It's great to go to to your mom's and, and be able to ask her questions like, hey, you know, did you ever struggle with this? And have them give you an honest answer, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's who my mom is. You know, she'll always give me an, an honest answer about how she's doing. You know, there's no secrets really about how my mom is doing, whether she says it out loud or not. Um, but she's always willing to share, you know, willing to share her experience. Um, and her background and her feelings. And I carried a lot of that with me, I, I think, growing up. You know, she really showed me the importance of just being open and honest about, about what's going on with you. And it makes being an adult feel a little less stressful, right? You don't feel like you need to be this perfect pillar 
every day you're going to have some off days you're going to be confused sometimes but that's okay you know i think that that was the biggest takeaway from the way my mom communicated with us you know when i wasn't in trouble at least that was the biggest takeaway <laughs> you know what about you reverend i tell you it's, it's interesting because first and foremost i'd have to say my, my mother's spiritual and god-fearing um every morning she says rosaries for all of us mm. um Anytime we're sick or test is coming up, she's going back. There's another rosary. I used to I always call her the ecumenical pope. Um, but she's she was a, an educator, and that was by profession. And she um, taught us quite a bit um, as far as not only educating others, which is so crazy because each of us in our own way have have been involved in some sort of of educational field, but she also told, taught us as far as responsibility because she was a working woman. And, um, you know, she, she showed you how it all juggled. You know, you get up in the morning, you got your grits, you got your toast, you know, get, get yourself ready for school. Let's go. Everybody's got to do what they got to do. You get home, you got your homework. Um, if your little sister, this, this is one of the things my father used to in, insist on. If, if your little sister's not, doesn't have A's and you have A's, that means you got homework. <laughs> homework. You all work together until you get it, you know. Um, she also was a, a very strong encourager. And um, my father used to always say, you know, don't forget what your name is. And and we would, which encouraged us, but she would push us when um, it seems as though odds were against us. I'll never forget one time I wanted to play in this band and all I had were these plastic bongos. Um, and these, these guys said, no, man, you don't play an instrument. You know, you're beating on the bottom of some pans, you know. And um, she said, why don't you and your sister dance and for this talent show? Not only did we get together and practice and practice and practice, and she made sure we did and dance, we won it. And my, my, all my friends was on the side. They were mad. You know, <laughs> We walking away with the, the uh, United States savings bonds. My mother, I said in the beginning, she loves to joke. Oh, she jokes all the time. But my mother, used, as I tell her, I said, you know, she always works on that psyche. You know, she she get inside instead of hitting you, she gets inside of your head, and then it's like, oh man, wait, wait, am I, am I, you know? And then later on, she's laughing. You know, <laughs> I got him again. You know, um, but but she's she's just a ton of I, I can't tell you enough. She just turned eighty nine, and every year she would always say, "Can you believe I'm eighty six? I say, "Yeah, next year you'll be eighty seven. Well, when she turned eighty nine, I waited till the next day. I said, "Okay, we got three hundred sixty four days to go." And we just start laughing about it, you know. Mothers are very special, and 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 I have to say this because this is what's been weighing on my heart since it started. We talk about the times, the good times we have with our moms, but there's so many times that mothers see their sons dying. Um, you know, from a biblical standpoint, you you think about Jesus on the cross. Um, I saw a mother who laid across the body of her son who was 23 years old, who had had a stroke and he was gurgling for over 125 minutes until he died. Um, and that pain is something that is, is you know, you, you have to take a step back and love them even more for them, not only having given life to you, but to watch you die before them. I just had, I just had a member of my church who lost her third son um, and, and when, and when you lose sons, especially to violence, and this is something at some point or another, the barbershop, you know, I, I noticed three of us ain't got no hair, but at the barbershop, we're going to have to talk about violence in our community and how to, how to address that. Because these are the things that when our mother see us go out the door, they know we got a hot temper, you know, they know that we're angry. They know all these things and they just want us to come home safe and alive, you know? And so when they pour all their en energy in us to go to college and to graduate uh, from, from, you know, wherever it is and um, be the director of this, that, and the other thing, there are a whole lot of mothers that they didn't get a chance to see that, you know, and we got to remember to show some love to them as well tonight because um, they're still hurting. They're, they're still grieving. And, um, and I love them as well. And I, and I just want to give that shout out to them. Yeah, no, I appreciate that Reverend, because especially this weekend, with Mother's Day coming up, you know, you don't ever stop being a mom, you know, whether your kid is still there or not. 
you don't really ever stop being a mom. So I appreciate you giving that shout out. And it gives it gives you responsibility, right? You know, there's something about the prospect of it's so easy to end up going down that wrong path, you know, but there's something about that prospect and not wanting to disappoint your moms that I think for a lot of us, it anchors us to maybe make those better decisions in the first place, right? You know, the, the idea of, you know, my mom could hit me or whatever all day, but the idea of my mom saying, man, I'm disappointed in you, whoo, you know, that that's something that really, I think probably for a lot of us really was a big motivating factor in making those good choices in the first place is, you know, how is she going to feel if I go out and get in some fight or end up in jail or, you know, you know, uh, you know, start start breaking the law and, and, and derail the family or, you know, how's my mom going to feel about that? Kevin, I saw you unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Reverend, for saying that. You know, um, I when we talk about moms and I, I'll throw grandmas in there, I throw aunts in there as well, you know, um, and, and giving them some special love and, and treating them with respect, right? You know, they've they've lived a long life. You know, my again, just like you, Jermaine, I'm 20 years young, my mom. Right. And so, you know, they've seen things, they've heard things, they've been through things that my girls might not even be go through, you know. And so um, I think we have to show them reverence. I think we have to show them love. I think we have to show them respect. Um, yeah. Yeah. I got it. You know, to get, pay, piggyback back off of that, it's, it's interesting because I remember one case with this guy, he hit his mother. Mm. Oh. And when I when I met him, I, I just asked him straight up. I said, what's your problem? <laughs> and he was like, are you my defense attorney? I'm asking you, what's your problem? You get your mama? What's your problem? Said, I'm sorry. I, I was I was drunk. I was this. I, I, I don't I don't want to hear none of that. So you gonna get in here and you are going to apologize to your mother. You know, I, I'm a little nuts like that, man. You know, that's my father's side of the family. You know, no, <laughs> no I, I, about that. Expect and respect for uh, for those that came before you who sacrificed and did everything they could to uh, make your life better. It's, it's, you know, I would have done the same thing. Yeah, and you know, that's the thing. Sacrifice is a good word, man, because especially in more traditional families with more traditional roles and stuff. You know, there's a lot of moms that put aside a career that put aside, you know, traveling, you know, going out with friends, you know, in life, life, man, when you have a kid, you know, my daughter's young, right? So this is still pretty new, new for me, but boy, is it like hitting the fast forward button on your life, man, the time just, it just flies by. And so, you know, when your mom, you're the one taking care of the kids, you know, you're the one taking care of the house, you're putting a bunch of other stuff aside to get that stuff done. You know, and 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 you're hoping that it, you know you're doing it out of love because you love your kids, you love your family. But then in return, as a kid, eventually you got to acknowledge what the women in your life did for you to make that work. You know, because that's yeah. I'm always saying time is the most valuable resource you can give anyone. Right? That's the most probably the most valuable personal resource you have is your own time. And moms, man, they're giving you a lot of times more time than they give themselves, you know, to, to take care of themselves. And so, man, the notion of not only being unappreciative of that, but ooh, laying a hand against your mom, man, I just can't, uh, no way. And my mom can fight too. That's the other thing. So I, I would never either way, but the, the notion of, I just can't imagine, I just can't imagine it. You know, that, that's a good segue for a question I want to, I want to ask though, because, you know, obviously there's a traditional idea of what a mom is. You know, it's the woman that birthed you a lot of times, that's your mom. But, you know, in a lot of families, sometimes that mom's not there. Sometimes you've got multiple people fulfilling that role of mom in your life. Are there any other women that have been in your life and your upbringing that you kind of consider a part of that role that, that's been influential on, on how you've turned out as an adult? You know, I have an older sister. Uh, she's she's almost seven years older than I than I am, and uh, she's always been that matriarch, you know, figure um, when mom wasn't around. You know, she always made sure that I was, you know, following the the rules, and you know, if I needed help with with schoolwork or you know, she needed to give me some advice or stand up 
for me or, or protect me. She was all always there, and she still she still does. Uh, she still looks out for me, even though you know I'm I'm not that little kid anymore. But <laughs> you know, she always be my my big sister, and you know, I always of course will be her little brother. Um, also, my grandmother. My grandmother. She even though she was not. She didn't have a lot of education. She was not a uh, former educator. She was, she was a Reverend. You would have loved her. She was a, a, a spiritual woman. Uh, she died singing hymns, and uh, but she all she had over fifty grandchildren, and the way that she loved you, she she loved you as though like she loved you the best, and she treated all her grandkids the same. And, you know, it was just that love, that compassion. But also she she had, um, you know, don't get it twisted. She wanted <laughs> you to do something with yourself. You know, she wanted you to go out and be productive, uh, not be somebody that's just, you know, making excuses. She was always there to support you and she would help you and encourage you. But, you know, it was none of this woe was me. It was like, no, you, you need to get up and you need to handle your business. And, you know, if grandma can help you out, what do you need help with? And so she was always quick to uh, step up. So, you know, I was very blessed and fortunate to have, you know, excuse my French, but a bunch of badasses as far as women, you know, in, 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 my, in my family, because all of them really contributed and, and did great things. And you were talking about sacrifice. My mom could have been an attorney, but, you know, at that traditional role, being an attorney and 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 a, and a and a homemaker, you know, she just knew that was not going to work. You know, it would require her to be away from school, you know, to to go to school a little bit longer. Also, you know, the the work schedule and things like that. So she actually settled and became a teacher. She's an outstanding teacher, but you know, I know that there was a different passion that that she had. And also, I remember because I grew up in Gary, Indiana. I don't know if some of you are familiar with, with Gary, Indiana, but it is, it is not it is not Beverly Hills by any stretch of imagination. So my mom would, you know, every weekend she would take us, you know, we wouldn't be there in, in the neighborhood. She would take us to Chicago to go to museums. We would mm-hmm. go to plays and shows. I remember I saw The Wiz with Diana Ross and Michael Jackson, you know, and then I, I got a chance to see different exhibits. I remember seeing King Tut. As, uh, as a little kid when they had uh, the exhibit at the National Museum of Science and Industry in, in Chicago. Or, you know, we would go to go to beach or maybe visit a family friend in another city. Anything to keep me from just being on the street mm. because, you know, obviously there was nothing in the street for me. And so my mom really wanted to make sure that, you know, she exposed us to a lot a lot of things that wasn't just like what what was what was in my environment and ultimately she sacrificed her retirement she used actually her retirement to get us out of gary even though she was not retirement age she used that money to uh transition us to a safer safer area where she was able to uh, get a better job we had a better quality uh home life home environment my sister went she attended Wellesley, um, you know, that, you know, that they didn't, they didn't take promises and or coupons, you know, so she, she really sacrificed a lot. So you talk about that sacrifice, you know, I also have to mention that. Um, and speaking of sacrifice, and I mentioned this at, at our last uh, meeting um, discussion that we had, my grandmother uh, was uh, uh, selected by the NAACP to do a, to basically do a sit-in to uh, ensure that her kids desegregated the school has got a chance to go to uh, a different, a different um, um, uh, education environment. And she would not take no for an answer. And, and all 13 of her kids graduated from the same high school in Alton, Illinois. And it was because of my grandmother that that happened. And also she allowed other kids that look like look like me to be able to to have that same opportunity. So, again, that sacrifice, that determination, that compassion, but that fire, as far as doing doing uh, by doing well by her her children and and her her grandchildren to, to be, that's that's what it's all about. That's that's when I when I when I think of a strong woman, that's the first image in my mind. Those three, those three women, and then in my life, 
that really uh, that really uh, got me where where I am today. That's good. That's good. Uh, you know, I, I tell you, I, I when you talk about other women, um, my grandmother pretty much took care of us when we were young while my mother was was working. And um, I have a lot of great fond memories of her. Um, she taught me about not running across the street, you know, when I was a kid. She taught me how to go get that uh, my own switch um, to get beat with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she she taught me she taught me how to respect, you know. Um, she 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 was just always loving. And then when she got older, she was in a wheelchair, and I'll never forget because we didn't see her as often, but. Um, I was growing my first afro, and uh, we had a cousin um, who was a barber. And so I walked in the house, and she looked at me, and she said, come here, baby, come here, come here. She said, here, go go over there and get $5 out of my purse, and go see Jimmy, and, and cut your hair. <laughs> and I was trying to explain to her that, you know, this is the style, and I realized, out of respect for her, I just said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go do it. And then the time I spent with my great grandmother, she taught me a lot because she was um, she was from the from the south. She was from still living down in Natchez, Mississippi, and she taught me a lot of things that um, talk about history. And I was the kind of kid I would just like to sit down and just listen, you know. And she tell me about how I remember I told her I said I want to be president of the United States, and she said don't do that. She she said please. Promise me you don't do that. And I said, why? She said, because they'll kill you like they killed my brother. She said, the the clan, they beat him to death and he was in a puddle of blood when I when I found him, you know. Um, at the same time, she told me to make sure I ate a red apple every day because it would keep me healthy. And the one other thing I did, I didn't realize, but she used to keep this, it was like a, a mason jar. And the mason jar had a had a top on it with water in it. And I would always say, what's that for? She said, that's for my eyes. I said, what do you mean for your eyes? Well, during the winter, she would put the cup outside. And when the snow would fall in, the water, she would say, was always the purest water to put in your eyes because it wasn't anything as visine and, and stuff like that. So I learned a whole lot of little bitty, you know, tricks. But I say this about, about, about moms, man, especially moms that, you know, have Southern roots. Um, there's certain things that uh, you know, little myths that they have, like they can go in our wallet, but it's bad luck to go into a woman's purse or on January the 1st, you're not supposed to wash any clothes because you wash somebody out of the family. I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, but to this day, we still don't wash clothes on January the 1st and I stay out of my wife's purse. You hear what I'm saying? I always found that my mom just made stuff up. So we didn't do it. It was her thing was always you don't turn the light on in the car because you can go to jail. And man, when I learned that that wasn't true and she just didn't light the light on, I was like, I learned that last year. It took me near 30 years of li life to realize that, that that wasn't true. 30, 30 whole years of life to realize. Because as mom, I would have never guessed that it would. Why wouldn't that be true? My mama told me if you it's keep nice. this light on, you can go to jail for that. It's in the head, man. Kevin, I'm sorry. Did I cut you off, man? Oh, no. Um, man. You know, as I said before, you know, my dad passed away um, and being a military kid, I wouldn't say brat, but being a military kid, you know, uh, we came back from Germany and we moved to my grandmother's house down in Southern Maryland. So Reverend talking about Southern roots in Southern Maryland, St. Mary's County. And so, you know, at that time, I think my grandmother had a couple of her kids in the house as well. And so for her to bring us into the fold, right, um, to offer a, a home over our head was like, wow. This is pretty. This is pretty spectacular, right? Um, and and was there enough rooms for everybody? No, but it was home, right? You know, and everything like that. And so you know, I remember Grandma. Every you know holiday, we come over Grandma's house. You know, whether Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, you know, have a big feast and everything like that. I also remember, just like you said, uh, Reverend, um, about going to get your own switch, right? Grandma had a nice big backyard, but outside the fence, that's where the trees were. And if you acted up, 
she would tell you, hey, you need to go get you a little switch and come on back here, right? And so I have a big family. My mom's side of family, I think my grandmother had 13, 15 kids, you know, so I have a whole bunch of cousins and everything like that. And so she treated us all with love, you know. Um, aunts, right? You know, again, when we moved to my grandmother's house um, and my mom would go to work and we would go to school when we come back, there was always a woman in the house, right? So there's, there's, you know, you if you're not doing your homework, you're going to get checked. Hey, Kevin, you know, what, what's going on with the homework? What you got to do? I know your mom was not here, but, you know, aunt this or aunt that is going to put you in check and like, hey, you need to know these are the things that you need to be doing, you know? And then I would say the moms around the neighborhood, right? And so the moms around the neighborhood, you know, we go out, hang out at one of your friend's house. There's a woman already there, you know, and they would also, how you doing? How's your mom? How's your grandma? What you been up to? You know, and they would, they would make sure that you stayed in line, you stayed in check. Um, but also if you got out of pocket, they would let you know. And then they would let you know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to have a little conversation with your grandma, your mom and your aunts. Right. So everybody knows, you know. Um, and so that's what I, I, I loved about sort of growing up in Southern Maryland, sort of that community. We talk about a village raising kids. Right. That old adage. I don't know about today, but that old adage of a village raising kids, that was the that was that was the model there. You had the your women in the household. You had the women in the neighborhood that took care of you, you know, and, and made sure you were doing the things that you were supposed to do and encouraging you along the way. Um, but also, you know, getting you straight when you kind of narrow, go off the path a little bit, um, they bring you back in line. So, yeah. Yeah, man, that's a good point. You know, my when I was in school, yeah, I would do this thing. I, I I don't like asking my parents for money because I know that I I know they'll give it to me. You know, yeah. even if they don't really got it. You know, I I know my mom will find a way to make it work, and I know they'd give it to me if I was struggling. And when I was in college, man, there was there was a couple times where, you know, you you struggling, you barely making ends meet. You got classes, you're trying to pay your rent, and and the 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 second time I ever got a little care package in the mail with food and stuff after, you know, getting one from my parents was actually from my best friend's mom, my best friend from high school's mom, you know, and they lived in, in Germany. They still lived in Germany where I went to high school, you know, and it was like, even though I'm in another country now, I'm not going to school with her son anymore. You know, we're all spread across the world. She still had that like secondary mom role where she just sent out some food and made sure I was eating you know, make sure I was taken care of, not because I said anything, but that's just because that's what, what moms do. Man, I need to hit her up. That was a great reminder. <laughs> See how yes, Mr. Do. is doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I recently, um, you know, it's Teacher Appreciation Week, right? Um, this, I think it's this week. And I don't know, I don't know if it was a spirit or what, you know, there's this teacher I had in high school. Her name is Mrs. Ellis. And I'm friends with her daughter on Facebook. And, you know, it's like, you know what? I'm going to send her a little text or a little message to tell her mom, hey, this is the kind of impact that you had on me in high school, you know. And so I I, I felt so good in sending it because I was like, this is long overdue, right? <laughs> this is long overdue, right. you know. So I sent it, um, you know, and her daughter responded, oh, my God, Kevin, thank you so much. You know, mom has, you know, teached a long time and she's come across a lot of students and she would be so glad to hear from you. And then she wanted to know my bio. So I sent her a little bio and stuff like that. So, you know, so it made me feel good, Jermaine. So if you do that, I think it's going to it's going to be like, yeah, that's that's something I should have done, you know. So, yeah, gratitude, man. I, yeah. You know, I don't I don't know if moms get it, you know, because society kind of just expects moms to be mom. Right. But mm. when you, if you were to break down it, like what moms do on a day to day in a job description, man, that's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You know, and I think that's a good reminder to just if you've got somebody in your life that's filling that role to show them some gratitude, yeah. show them some love, yeah. you know, because they're putting in a lot of work to make sure you're taken care of and you've got support. You've got support. Yeah, yeah. that's great. That's great. Well, that's the next, sorry, go I ahead. Let me share this story with you. Yeah, we're talk, because we're talking about those that that also had an impact. When my grandmother passed away, it hit me. I was about 15. It hit me so hard that. I wanted to do everything I possibly could for the funeral. So 
I did. I helped as far as serving for the mass and I read and I was a pallbearer. And then I got into this uh, limo afterwards with after we were leaving the cemetery and I got in this limo and all the, the men in there were, oh, my God. I mean, I was 15. They seemed like they were ancient. OK, they were probably the same age I am now. And um, I hear this music. And it was somebody singing, I'll be there. And I thought it was her. Now I realized later on it was Michael Jackson and Jackson Five. But to this day, every time I hear that song, I know that she's right there with me, you know? And sometimes when I hear it, it's like, uh oh, I'm about to go into some serious stuff and she just need to let me know, baby, I got you. I got, we still got you, you know? So, you know, it, there's different ways that you can continue to allow them to live in your life. And, um, and like I was listening to you all talk about, you know, your children, you were talking about, Kevin was talking about, you know, his two daughters and that love that your mother has, you share with them, you know, um, Jermaine, I know with that little one you got, you know, you, you just look at you, you're smiling already, man. <laughs> that's all you got to do, you know, um, that's, that's just what they bring to the table. And so when you talk to your children about them, it's nothing but love and respect, you know, and that's always a good thing. So that's a great point, man. You can honor your mom in a lot of different ways, you know, even if you're not talking to them directly. Kevin, I saw you and me. Were you going to throw something out there? No, no, no. Go ahead. All right, cool. Uh -huh. well, well, the next question that I wanted to ask, ask you gentlemen is, was there a piece of advice that your mom ever gave you or a woman in your life gave you that you still come back to a lot that's really formulated your life? You know, I, you know, I'll go, and it wasn't even necessarily advice, but my mom used to do this thing. And when, when we were young, young, ooh, it used to drive us up the wall, but she used to love playing devil's advocate. So, you know, if we had an opinion, if we had an opinion about something, you know, anything, yeah, politics, something small, you know, she would challenge us on it and not super hard, but she would really kind of challenge us, debate us, almost take the stand, the opposite stance as if that's what she believed. And, and it would turn into these long, you know, two, three hour conversations in the kitchen every time, you know, if we brought up an opinion, she played devil's advocate. And and that really formulated, formulated like my politics as an adult. You know, it, it was really always considering, well, what's the other side of thinking? How do they feel? You know, even if it's polar opposite, what are they feeling? I, I need to stop and always think about the fact that someone's going to have a different opinion than me and it doesn't make them a bad person because my mom's not a bad person and if she can understand those opinions then maybe there's plenty of other good people that believe totally opposite than me and that really that formulated my opinion a lot it was that and it was always one for all all for one you know i've got two younger siblings you know and, and like we were saying if they were struggling, that means I was struggling, regardless right. of how I was doing, you know? If if they didn't do the chores, that means we didn't do the chores. <laughs> you right. know, is, is what, and that really formulated how, how I grew up to view, you know, how you treat your neighbors, how do you treat your coworkers, you know, what's your responsibility to other people in your community? You, you know, it really stems from my mom really hammering home, taking perspective, and that you, you're responsible to everybody. You know, somebody in your neighborhood is really struggling. That's your responsibility too, you know, because they're, they're part of your community. Well, I'll, I'll say something. Um, my parents, especially my mom, they were, they were big in education. Um, they're both educators. Um, my mom, you know, her... Her family didn't have much. My grandparents didn't didn't have much, but my mom had already always had pushed stressed education. You know, she thought and still believes that education is is the greatest equalizer. You know, in spite of you know things that you know from a racial standpoint that that go on in our society, the only thing that they can't take away is your education. And, you know, my grandparent, you know, this is coming from my grandmother who had that edict uh, for her kids. You know, this is a woman that I don't think had passed a sixth grade education. Stress to my mom, you know, education. And my mom was the first person in her family out of, out of, out of those kids to uh, get her get her college degree. 
And in turn, she imparted that same edict to to my sister and myself, and um, it it paid dividends. So even when I got my ba- my bachelor's degree, I was I was like, oh, I'm, I'm good. She was like, oh no, you're you're, you're not. <laughs> and she she would she stayed on me for three and four years until I finally just said, all right, fine, I'll get my master's. But after that, that's it. <laughs> and you know, and it's and it's funny. I'm still like the least educated person in my family, and I and I have a master's degree, but you know education it really helped me out a lot and in turn it also is something that i was able to from an experience standpoint impart to my kids as well you know they're both actually on their way to uh um college this year uh, my son he's gonna go to hampton my daughter she she got accepted to hampton although i'm not sure i can i can handle that bill hey, but congratulations. uh <laughs> well, we'll see hey. they're gonna go yeah. somewhere i could i could promise you that but <laughs> It was all because of the example that my, my mom had given us, but also had made sure that we followed through. And um, so I would say that is advice that was well received and well earned. And uh, yes, my mom, she's still alive. Uh, she is 81, she will be 82 in, in November. My sister's an MD. And you know she is uh, she actually manages a um, um, hospital for one of the the local tribes here, and she mm-hmm. is uh, like I said, just we look back on on our, our parents finally, but especially my mom because it it was our mom that really pushed that education. You know she's the one that took my sister out to various testing sites and things like that, or you know made sure that. You know, we we arrived on time for the SAT, ACT, had materials to study, um, helped us pick colleges, all that. You know, so that is that is something that a gift that is something that you pass on to generation to generation. Because you know, you look at you know some other some other family units, you know, there might not be anybody in there that passed a high school education, if that. So that's definitely something that I'm I'm very uh, happy and proud of my mom being able to impart. Well, man, a master's, that's the lowest education in your family is a master's, man. That's, ooh, that's pressure. That's wild. <laughs> man, you should have seen report card day and uh <laughs> That's my chest is sweating. Woo! He's sweating. He's sweating. <laughs> Hopefully she'll take the C. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, I don't know if my mom gave, you know, words like words of wisdom. I, I, I was always someone who just, uh, what's the word observed. Right. And, and, and I think, you know, um, when we moved back to the States from Germany and I was 13 years old, you know, my mom gave me, a, I would say a lot of autonomy to kind of figure things out. Right. Uh, whether that is, okay, you know, you need to be, what time you need to be in the house, you know, um, the friend type of friends that you hang around um, and different things like that. She gave me sort of that freedom to kind of explore. And, and maybe that was her way of, okay, this is how I best know how to raise this boy, right? Is to let him kind of figure these things out. And that has kind of trickled down to how I deal with my girls. Now, granted, my girls have a lot of and I told this, this, them, they have a lot of information flowing to them, right? I mean, it is, it is, I, I, and I apologize to them one day, like, I am so sorry that y'all are bombarded with all this information because when I grew up, it was go outside, have fun, right? Go ride. Yeah, you really bike. only knew what was happening around in that, you. Yeah. Right. In, in that cul de sac where we lived at or that community where we lived at. And so, I'm trying to teach my girls, okay, there's some sort of basic things that you have to figure out on your own. I don't want to have to give you the answers all the time, right? Or, you know, something that I feel like, well, maybe they should know this, right? They should know this, um, that, hey, you look it up or, you know, try to figure it out. And so I think my mom has sort of instilled in that sort of, okay, you come across a situation or um, whether it be relationships, whether it be, you know, um, a situation, you're going to have to figure this out. 
right? Uh, my mom had a 12th grade education. She graduated from high school. Um, but outside of that, take odds and ends jobs and different things like that, you know? And so for me, it was, okay, I have a lot of autonomy. I can screw this up by really going out here and messing up, right? And then I'm going to have my grandmother and my aunts to answer to, as well as my mom, or I can, okay, I see this freedom that I've been given. I'm not going to mess this up. So I'm going to stay on the straight and narrow. I might veer off just a little bit, kind of test stuff here, you know, but my mom gave me that, that autonomy to kind of figure things out. And so I think that's what, that's what she's left me with. And by the way, mm -hmm. Vanessa, my mom is still alive. She's 71 years old. So that's a blessing. That's a blessing. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's funny. I, I think about it as I was listening to um, um, the comments I kept thinking about how my mom was, she always wanted you to have the best education you could possibly get. And um, when it came time for me to go to high school, I had an opportunity to go to an all boys Catholic high school out in the suburbs. And um, I wanted to go to a public high school where my father was a track coach. And she tried her best to navigate that conversation, but she knew my mind was made up. That's, that's what I wanted to do. And then when I got down to Arizona State University, after I pretty much just locked myself away and just study, study, studied, I said to her, I want to try to transfer to Harvard. And she said, no. She says, you're not going to be a campus bum. You're going to finish what you started right there. Now, for her, finishing what you started was, you know, like listening to Edward, you know, you get that college degree. So when I look up and I have a sister who's got her doctorate degree and she's overseeing Rush Hospital as the vice president there and another sister with two master's degrees, you know, and, you know, she looks at us now saying, you all went beyond what we did. But see, the thing about it was in, in modeling her, she went and got her master's degree in education. And so it wasn't a matter of going beyond. It was a matter of just trying to keep up, you know, but she did not want you to give up. You know, my father, she and my father were together till I was about 19. So he was a very influential individual. And a lot of times when I, especially when I'm listening to, to Edward and Kevin, a lot of times, you know, you had him there who provided that guidance as well. And so she would just support you. But like I said, when, when it came time to get that whipping, if she felt as though, you know, he was going a little bit too far, she'd step in, she'd step in, Gerald, Gerald. <laughs> yeah. But um, and then I have three younger sisters and those three younger sisters, I was always taught to um, take care of my little sisters. I don't care what it was. I can't tell you how many. Yeah. How many fights I was in taking care of my little sisters, you know. Um, but it keeps a, it, it kept us together to this day, you know, and when something happens that, that's involving my mom, there's no hesitation. We're jumping on a Zoom and we need to talk, you know, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Man, speaking of education, man, uh, you know, my mom used to, and I used to hate it when I was a kid, but, you know, when school was out for the summertime, she'd come up with her own lesson plans just to keep us, <laughs> she, would make, she would make our homework just to keep us learning throughout the summertime. And boy, when you're a kid and you just want to go play with your friends, boy, do you hate it. You're the only one in school. But, you know, that really drove home, you know, she was helping put in a lot of that work for us so that by the time, you know, I got to college or high school, that stuff became easy. That was habit, you know, having a lot of school work and study and that was just habit because she did that anyway. I remember when I came out of kindergarten, I couldn't read still, you know, I still couldn't read. I, just, I didn't pick it up, you know, and she was so worried about it that she spent that summer and she bought a bunch of Dr. Seuss books because the words are long and they're, they're made up, you know, so you have to sound them out. And she spent that summer teaching me how to read using those books, you know, just in my room, you know, and by the time I got to, to middle school, I was reading at a high school level. By the time I got to high school, I tested out of the, the high school reading level. And it all came from really the way my mom taught me how to read because she knew, she knew how I was going to learn. And that stuff was important to her. You know, she didn't go to college, but it was important that, we still did well in school and got our education. And, and so that really, that drives it home, man. I, I got to give her a call tonight. I'm going to send her this video after we're done talking tonight. Uh, but but uh, another question that, that I wanted to ask y'all is, 
you know, so technically everyone at the very least has, they came from somewhere, right? You got a mother, you got a moms, right? A lot of us have moms from different backgrounds. Other cultures have moms, but in your mind, how is the mom in a black family? How is their role maybe a little bit different than in other cultures or backgrounds? Or is it different at all? Is that something that's more universal to you guys? Or are there some different kind of responsibilities, roles that you think a, the, the black mom takes on? Well, I would say this though, black mom, you know, I think you you've you've seen maybe on social media or, or other places, you know, the the saying I have a black son. I I can only imagine what it was like for for our parents. You know, my my dad grew up in the south, Mississippi, my mom grew up in uh central Missouri, you know, so and obviously that was during uh different times. Um and so I know for 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 her it's it's a different hurdle because you know unfortunately we have different hurdles to climb even even to today and i i know uh for any black woman that has a son or a daughter it it is it is extremely difficult to navigate a lot of things because there's bias that exists like everywhere it could be your your teachers it could be the policeman on the street. It could be the boss that won't let her off to to go to her son's son's football game. It could be it could be a, a, a lot of things. There's a lot of a lot of hurdles that you know, and that the average black woman had to had to over, overcome. And you know, it is. I'm I'm grateful for again me having the strong African American women in my family because they in turn had kids that they had to do the same thing. You know, I have nieces and nephews. The last nephew just graduated from Arizona state. My sister went three for three, you know, having kids go, go through school and she's a doctor on to on, boot. And she did a lot of this really as a, as a single mom for, 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 for a while. Um, my mom, you know, she had to again, have a professional career, but also navigate, you know, the um, the complexities of raising kids in an environment that may not necessarily like, like, you know, like your kid, you know, and I remember there was like an incident in, in high school where this woman, one of my teachers gave me a lower my, I had like the highest grade in the English class. And there was an assignment that I got around and, 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 I, I did it, but I did it in, in a way that she did not not appreciate or, 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 or support, condone. So she dropped my grade, a whole letter grade. And this is like, it wasn't it wasn't that big of a deal. And quite quite honestly, I really didn't even care because I I was I had already made my plans to go to college. I was still I still had a, a good grade in the class. I was I was done. My mom insisted on going up to the school and, ha and having and having a discussion or at least at the very least let the teacher know i'm watching so you know just just be aware but you know again but this is no different from what other african-american women had to do before again my grandmother who did the sit-in so her kids can go to go to go to go to the same schools as their uh non african non-black peers um i i definitely feel that African-American women have a lot tougher job raising kids, especially, you know, and I think we talked about this before, especially with, with African-American men, young men, just being sometimes targeted by, by law enforcement. And, you know, there's times I've had, uh, I had a situation come up to where my mom had to, had to sort of interject. And I was just at the wrong place at the wrong time, but she wanted to make sure that I was going to be okay. So again, this, these are just things that we still see today. I can only imagine what it was like raising kids in the forties and fifties and sixties and, and so forth. It's, it's, it's challenging to say the least. So I would say the, the obvious, you know, the, the actual racial bias that, you know, African-American mothers had to endure that definitely, Adds a level of complexity that no other non-black 
uh, mom would have to deal with. Yeah, man. I, I remember when I was um, moving here, you know, so I went to high school overseas. We we're in a military family. And, and it, you know, I love, we love living in Germany. It was great. And when you live on a military base, it's diverse. It's pretty diverse, you know, because it's a military base. Everybody's pretty mixed in there. And so I was leaving the college and they had to stay, you know, in Germany. So it was just going to be me out here. And we were looking for a church for me to go to for when I got out here. And, you know, uh, I live in Flagstaff, Arizona. We hadn't really been there before. It's a small town. Didn't know much about it. And, and my mom, you know, I'm mixed, so my mom isn't isn't black, but I, I'm black. And so she emailed the church ahead of time and emailed the pastor and was like, look, I'm sending my son there. He's going to go to your church and he's black. Is he going to be okay? Like, is she checked ahead of time for me? You know, she was like, is he going to be okay? Is the church accepting? You know, black people, please be honest with me. Is it a good environment for him to go to? You know, because she knew. You know, when you're when you are parents and a black kid, you've got it. I feel like you've got an extra layer of protection you're providing. You know, you you've got to almost be a little hyper aware. And and even though I was 18 at that point, I was going to be on my own. She was still. I didn't know. She didn't tell me she was going to email the pastor ahead of time and ask if it was okay. Uh, I don't even think that that she ever told me. I think the pastor was the one that actually told me. Uh, a year or two later, but you know that's what mom does. Is you know you got a, a black kid and you want to make sure they're safe and and I, I just think you you have to take a little extra care and, and protection, you know, and protection. And then the other thing was with my mom, it was important for her that I knew my culture because we were moving around a lot. You know, you know, being a military family every two or three years, we didn't get to grow up around a lot of family, and so my mom always wanted to make sure that we knew our roots. You know, we knew our history. We knew we were educated about slavery. If they weren't teaching it enough in school, she was going to teach us about it. She's going to watch the documentaries with us. She was going to read the books to us. She's going to make us watch the entirety of Roots. You know, so we knew about our culture and our people. That was always really important to her, is that we knew who we were, even if we weren't around other people like ourselves. And so, yeah, you know, I really appreciated that. I, I really feel like I got such a strong sense of identity from the work that my mom put in, you know, we never really forgot who we were, you know, we always were able to appreciate that because of the work she put in there. So. Yeah. It's interesting as I was listening to Edward, um, I can't say that I can necessarily speak for other races. Um, I can tell you that from the courtroom, every mother hurts when they see their son uh, is being taken away. Um, they always want the best. But I know as an African-American, mothers really hurt. Um, it's not only as far as the police are concerned, but also as far as gangs are concerned. You were talking about Gary, Indiana, and I'm talking about the south side of Chicago. And they want to make sure that you're safe. They want to make sure that you do get home, regardless of whether it's law enforcement or, or, or thugs. I mean, either way. And um, you find where, at least for me, where the encounters that I might have, <clears throat> especially from, from the gang side, I wouldn't say anything to her about because I didn't want her to worry. You know, um, Instead of coming home a certain way, I may take the railroad tracks, come down another way um, in order to, to avoid all of that. And thank God I did. I mean, I'm here today. I remember uh, um, Fred brother and I, uh, we were going down to our, our National Alpha Convention, and he and I were going to drive down there. I was 21, big fro, you know, had all kinds of testosterone, and we were, we were ready to roll, okay? She got up that morning, we were supposed to leave, and she went completely off about how I was not going anywhere. Now, needless to say, I'm 21. My father's not home no more to, 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 to grab me by the throat, Okay. I was not going anywhere. I was not. She had a dream that night that I wound up in Alligatorville, Kentucky, and they got a hold of her son. And no, you're not swinging by anybody's tree. I gave too much life. You put stretch lines on my stomach. I mean, I went through the whole thing and I just sat there and I just listened to her, you know. And then afterwards, I said, uh, Mom, he couldn't get the car, so we can't go. And she didn't even hear me. She was still going off about how I was not going to go. 
but that's the kind of fear that black mothers have had to deal with. And so as a result, in, in loving us, they realize that we wear this every day. And when we walk out, just like Jeremy, Jermaine, you're talking about your mom call, calling the pastor. He's somebody who's supposed to be there to help you. <laughs> calling the pastor. You better love my son. Otherwise, you don't want me to come over here, you know. But that's the kind of love our mothers, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers have, have had to deal with for, for so long. And like I said, when my great grandmother talks about holding a brother in her arms while he's dying, um, my my grandmother, when my, my uncle thought he was going to get a little mouthy, oh, she didn't have any problem grabbing whatever was necessary to throw it, hit you with it, whatever it was, but to get your point across. And this man went into the military and, and came out and, and he lived till he was 79 years old. He was, he was a lot of fun, you know. Um, he was a good man. So our mothers go through a lot. Black mothers and mothers of, of black sons, they go through a lot because they realize what the world is, is when they look at us, what they see. And and I get sick and tired always every time I walk out, I'm a, I gotta be an angry black man, you know? I, I wake up in the morning, I ain't angry. You all make me, make me angry, you know? Grabbing your purse. I don't want your purse. Did you see how much money's in my wallet? You know, get, you better get away from me, you know? But our mothers, they realize that, you know? And then they also realize that we got to deal with, you know, some other crazy nonsense, you know, out there. Because being women, they know how women are. You know, oh, they found, oh, your son's going to college? I need to marry him. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, I need to check you out first. You know, it ain't going to be none of that. You know what I mean? And they're very protective of that as well, which... I'm telling you, I'm really grateful for because they will give you some good advice. You know, uh, my dad, my daddy used to always say, only cats and dogs roam the street at night. And when I was young, I used to say, what is he talking about? When I got older, I said, mm, yeah, I understand. You know, so you might as well come on in when the lights come on. Come on, you know. Yeah, man, mama. It was important before I got married, man, if, if mom didn't sign off on who who I was dating, it wasn't going to work. It just wasn't going to work, man. <laughs> you know, even if I liked him, it wasn't going to work. If, if mom didn't sign off on, on wife, she wasn't going to be wife. So, you know, man, they, you they, got three younger sisters. Trust me. They, they, they got to sign yeah. off too. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know how that goes. What about you, Kevin? What, you know, with mother, do you think that looks any different for the black family? I mean, I, I I can't add anything other than, you know, uh, ditto what uh, Edward said and, and the Reverend said, you know, I think there's layers to it. Um, and I see it myself now, right, as a parent of two girls, um, you know, when they leave the house, okay, where are you at? Who are you around? What are you doing? All right, mom, dad, I want to go here. Okay, well, tell me, you know, I got one daughter, like I said, who's 13. And, you know, she has friends, right? And my interpretation of friends are different than her interpretation of friends, right? And so I'm asking, okay, well, you know, tell me about your friend. Well, she tells me her name. And I'm like, okay, can you give me, give me some more information? Because I want to know who you're hanging around with, right? I want to know, even if I could, what their parents do, you know, who are their parents and different things like that. And um, my girls are mixed race. Um, my wife is Mexican. And so, you know, they uh, attend Coconino High School as well as Sanawa Middle School. You know, and if if you know anything about flag, it's it's there's, you know, they're probably the only I can count on one hand. It's not the most diverse yes. metropolis in the world. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, um, um, so you know, I'm I, I wouldn't say over hype, but just aware. And there's certain things that I have to think about and also my wife have to think about, you know, when we're sending our kids out this door. Right. You know, they want to ride their hoverboards. OK, be careful where you go. Right. Make sure you pay attention to who you are around. Make sure you pay attention to your surroundings. Right. Or if they want to walk over to a friend's house. OK, where are you going to be at? What time are you coming back? Call me when you get there. Call me when you leave. Right. Those so check in points and stuff like that. And so, um, you know. I think that, again, that's kind of trickled down to me from my mom is like, all right, I need to make sure where you're at, make sure you're safe, make sh to put her mind at ease. And it also puts my mind at ease. Right. Um, so, yeah. And as far as, you know, my wife, 
like I said, you know, uh, she's Mexican and she, I would say lives, her mom lives in a border town down in Nogales, Arizona. Right. And so, you know, met her, her mom and welcome me with open arms, welcome the grandkids and everything like that. But I also see her struggles, right. You know, not being able to speak English that well and, and dealing with some different things that folks have to deal with down on the border that my mom has no idea of what's going on. Right. You know, so I see that as well. So, and I think Reverend put it, put it greatly that moms worry about their sons. Right. Um, regardless. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of aspects to motherhood that are pretty universal. You know, moms love their kids, you know, really regardless of culture and race. So I appreciate always having that 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 caveat on there. Folks, I got one more question for you. Uh, and, and this is what I'm looking forward to hearing your answer on is, you know, so now we're all adults, you know, and, and like we answered Vanessa's question, all of our moms are still around, um, you know, still alive. We've got the opportunity to talk to them. And I guess the question that I want to ask is, uh, as an adult, as an adult man, black man, what does taking care of your mom mean or look like to you now? Oh, what does that actually mean to take care of your mom? Because you know, when you get older, yeah, your moms have paid their dues. You, it sounds like we've all, you know, made it. We're successful. You got the families, and so we're in that caretaker role. And so, you know, what is our responsibility? And was it it mean to to actually take care of your mom? What's that relationship look like now? I, for me, man, um, it's calling every weekend, right? <laughs> I make that phone call either Saturday, Sunday, check in on mom, see how she's doing. Um, does she need anything? Um, and living, you know, Arizona and she's in Maryland, you know, but she's surrounded by family there. Um, but for me, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a weekly check-in, you know, to, to say, Hey, you know, been thinking about you, how are things going, you know, giving her updates about the kids, you know, and I haven't flown home, man, I think I was home last September during the pandemic and that was just for a funeral but I haven't flown home in a while, you know? And so, and typically when we do, you know, I, I, I hang out with my mom, you know, for a while, you know, different things like that, but it's checking in with her weekly. It's, you know, if she needs something, you know, try doing my best to give that to her or send that to her. Um, if she wants advice, you know, she, she asked me for advice. I'm like, how are you asking me for advice? Right. But I'll give it, you know, whether she follows it or not, you know, you know, I think one of the big things was about the COVID shot when it was available, you know, and she, you know, like I said, my mom is, is a woman of few words. And so I brought it up like, hey, you know, are, are you thinking about, you know, getting the shot? And there was silence on the phone. So to me, that meant no, I ain't doing this. And so I kind of talked to her about sort of the, uh, in my opinion, and because I know it's very controversial, sometimes it's controversial, but in my opinion, I think you should do it. And these are the reasons why, you know, um, and, and, and so she ended up getting the shot, getting both shots. And so I was very proud of her for doing that and everything like that. So, um, so it's, it's, again, it's sort of that check-in, um, you know, sharing stories about the girls, you know, making sure she's taken care of. Um, oh, one funny story, if I can say this, you know, one funny story, um, you know, the, the election, right. Uh, the 2020 election. And I was always under the impression that my mom had voted before, right? It it, it 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 never came up. You know, I was just like, okay, yeah, she's, you know, she's voted before, you know, I ain't got to ask her anything like that. So we were talking about the election and she said, well, Kevin, um, no, I heard it from one of my cousins. This is the first time my mom voted. And I was like, what? Right. I said, Southern Maryland, right? I'm I'm sort of processing through here. Southern Maryland, and and this is you know growing up in Southern Maryland. This is your first time voting, so we had a conversation about that. But she she told me you know why you know this was her first time voting, and so and and so for her sharing that with me, I was like, okay, I get that. But I said in 2024, you going to be in the front line to go vote, right? You know, and different things like that. So I wanted to share that because that was I was like. I was, I was confused, right? I was really confused at that particular point in time, but I wanted to share that story. But, you know, I'll continue to check in on my mom, you know, weekly, make sure she's squared away, so. 
Oh yeah, oh yeah. Thanks for that. Good and good for you, man, with that vaccine. Good for you, making sure that gets done. That's a big deal. What about you, Mister Lumpkin? What's it mean to to take care of your mom? You know, I, I guess I've been doing it really since you know my parents divorced uh, when I was nine. So I remember, you know, when uh, my dad was moving out, and you know he was just about to to leave, you know, he told me, he said, no, now you're the man of the house. And I took that to heart. And, you know, my mom, she would, uh, give me examples of, you know, when I was like, you know, a little kid and we would go to like church or someplace like that. I would always position myself in between her and the next person. And, or if there were some things that needed to be done around the house, I'd step up and do it. So on and so forth. And, you know, even even though you know I know I don't live with my mom any, anymore, I still do those things. You know, I, I still go over there to fix things. Um, you know, some breaks down, whatever. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still I still do that, and so that part has never has never never changed. Now there is a bit of a role reversal. I mean, obviously, when when your parents get older, you you take more of a lead role in terms of you know, some of their activities and, and so forth. And uh, so, you know, my sister and I, we, she also lives here as well. And we collectively do that. You know, I usually handle the logistics, things that need to be fixed or errands or things like that. You know, my sister, she'll take her on vacations and, you know, my, my mom's got a chance to see Iceland, you know, Italy, uh, Alaska, go on cruises. I mean, just, all the things that, you know, because again, you know, that whole sacrifice that we, we, we spoke of earlier, now it's time to re repay it. And in terms of making mom's life different, making mom's life easier, helping mom out, because growing up, mom helped us out. So now we're returning the favor because now we have the means to do that. So for me, that's, that's really what I, I guess that has never really changed a lot because I have been doing that since I was nine. And, you know, I still try to be the man of the house that she allows me to be. Obviously that's her house and she can do, you know, what, what she wants, but she lets me be that role and she encourages that. And, and I appreciate her for that as well, because, you know, my mom is still near and dear to my heart. And, um, you know, first woman I loved and, and be the, and be, be the last because, you know, she was, she gave birth, she gave life to me and, um, she's just been an amazing guy in my life. And I'm grateful to God that I have her as my mom, because she, she by far to me is the epitome of what a mother should be. You know, I, that, that's beautiful. I, that, it's really beautiful. My mom lives in Chicago. And, um, so my sisters are there with her. Um, and, um, one of my sisters in particular, who's, who, like I said, oversees the hospital, she is the one who has stepped up because she was gone for a while. And uh, before then, my other sisters, as far as helping out with groceries or whatever the case may be, but because my mom is now starting to, um, uh, forget things and I'm putting that mildly, um, I do call her every morning. And sometimes you, you find yourself where you're patient because you may say something and then let in less than three minutes, she'll ask you the same thing or she'll tell you the same story. And you, you're just patient with her. And there are times that I'll share things that from our past and she'll say, I don't remember that at all. And I just jokingly say, that's why I'm around in order to make sure you do remember, you know? Um, but I can't thank my sisters enough. Um, and I saw where, when I watched when my grandmother was an invalid and she was getting up at 4.30 in the morning in order to go over and, and make her breakfast and change um, her pads and, and, and make sure that she was comfortable and then coming home and making breakfast for us and, and then making sure that we got off to school and then coming back and making sure dinner was there, you know, and telling us to get the homework done and, and wash the dishes and everything else. It's nice when, you, when you, you're able to say, okay, you paid your dues. And the last time that I was home and I went and, and I saw her, it, it gave my, my sister time off in order to, she just needed that time off. But my mom clung to me. I mean, I could, 
I said, I'm, I'm going outside. Why? <laughs> Where are you going? When you coming back, mama, I'm going to get my white castle. You know, I need my fix. <laughs> and so she would be like, okay, go ahead. Just, I said, do you want any? No. And as I'm walking out the door, bring me one back. You know, I mean, that kind of thing, you know. Um, but I had, I had, and I cherish those times that we're together because I know that it's best not to leave her side. These are the only times I have now, you know, at 89 years old, I'm just grateful to God that she's still here. And, um, Every once in a while, I'll imitate my dad, and that'll just start. We just start laughing about that. And she says, I don't remember anything he would say. I called one morning. I said, She said, Who is this? And I said, This is Gerald. And she, <laughs> she always calls me by my nickname. And I said, She said, Gerald. I said, Yeah, baby. Hey, it's me. <laughs> I came back. And she's like, Oh, no, I'm hanging up the phone right now. You know, and <laughs> And so we we do those kinds of things in order to bring joy to each other's life. And like I said, if there's that one time during the day that you know that you're going to be able to laugh, you know, that's what's so important. And, and I'm grateful to God that I'm able to, to add that. So I, I commend you brothers that still are able to go and see your mom and talk with your mom. Um, I wanted to be honorary and go home last May. My sister told me, don't you even think about it. Not to mention, you know, you got that mayor back there that says, keep your butt at home. You know, she don't let you rolling up in Chicago, you know, little bitty thing. But, you know, she's tough. So. Yeah, man. It, you know, for me, it's it's great to hear hear, hear y'all talk about how, how you check in with your moms and talk to them. Because that's really, you know, just making sure they have that connection. You know, since we're both, you know, semi-close in age. He's a semi close in age for a mother and son. You know, she's always going to be my mom. I'm always going to be her son. But we also have an opportunity to be friends now, right? You know, you know she'll keep me in check if I need to be in check, but I think I, I do pretty good, you know? So there's not too many times she needs to keep me in check. And so we can just talk and see, like, how are you doing really? Like, what's going on in your life? You know, what are your goals? You know, how can, how can I support you in accomplishing those goals? You know, just to really check in and make sure she's got that support you know, from multiple places, you know, as another person, as another adult, you know, understanding what it's like to move through the world, you know, it, it's great to have the opportunities to just call and check in and, and talk about how's the week going, you know, what are you actually up to, how are you feeling with everything going on, you know, maybe we have a couple of philosophical debates, stimulate the mind a little bit, you know, but it, it, it's always a good time, you know, when, when you get to the point where you can have those open conversations, you know, you just never want to take it for granted. Never want to take it for granted. Um, you know, because I, I always find myself, anytime something good happens, you know, my wife lives here, so she's the first person I tell, but the second second person, I'm picking up the phone and I'm, I'm calling mom just to let her know, hey, something good happened. You know, this happened at work. I got this promotion. I finished school, you know, just to let her know that's a result of the work you put in, you know, you know, I could be a different person, but you know, these successes are your successes too. And so sharing that and having those conversations that, you know, it's, it's always great. It, it's always great. And, and hopefully I can have those for a long time to come. Uh, well, the last thing folks, you know, before we go, uh, obviously this will be recorded and you know, if your moms are tech savvy or you got someone around them, that's tech savvy, you'll have the opportunity to send this out to your moms. Is there anything you want to say to your mom specifically? Happy Mother's Day, mom. I love you. Yeah, I, you stole it, Rev. I mean, you you took it. <laughs> happy no, Mother's Day. I was taking Day. the good ones. Yeah, happy Mother's Day, mom. Love you so, so much. Happy Mother's Day to my mom and all the the moms uh, in, the, in the world. You guys have a difficult job and we all appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day, mama. I'll talk to you later. All right. <laughs> all right, Bernadine. I think that's all we got. Uh, and she might be having trouble hopping back on, so we'll give her a minute. And if not, we can just go ahead and close out and call it a night, guys. Okay. Thank you so much. Hey, enjoy the conversation. Appreciate yeah, you, brother. Yeah, me too. Y'all take all care right. of yourselves. I got to do that lunch. Yeah, right, yeah. Please let me know. Take care. <laughs> all right.